Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about EcoTwin, which is a digital image correlation program created by a French company called Ecosum. And uh, today we're going to go step by step to work on uh, an example to see how this program is work. Before I start, I have to say that uh, this is not uh, a promotion video. It's not supported by the uh, uh, by the by ecosim the the company who created uh, this software but actually it is under their supervision because i want to get the more accurate information to the audience that are watching this video so anyway if we would like to start let me start by you know what we need to prepare before start analysis or using this program so <coughs> sorry what I prepared before, we have pre-calibration points. We will talk about that uh, shortly. We prepared images that we need to analyze for sure. And since we have two cameras, so I have uh, 56 image in each folder. If we go to uh, set camera number two, we can see the same number at total. The first image is the image was taken before loading. And at each loading stage, we added a picture. We took picture. Uh, so that's, that's, that was the images. And we have also mesh. We created uh, a mesh by uh, a finite element program. Here I used Abacus and I extracted the uh, job. Uh, we can talk about that in another video. And we have the datum pictures, which we will talk about shortly as well. Okay, so let's get started and use the program. So we will start the program at tab called images. As you can see, as we will progress, these tabs will be uh, activated one by each other. So we will add pictures from camera number one. So I will go to this folder, test, and I will add the images from camera number one. Here you can see that the images are going from image number zero to 55, the last image. And as we can move, we can see some deformations going on until we reach the end. We can see the crack happening here and failure at the end. Okay, so that was for camera number one. Now we need to add camera number two. And this is camera number two. So we have pictures from camera number one and pictures from camera number two. Okay, so we have add that. Now, we can see that the second tab, which is Mish's tab, was activated. So let's go to that tab. First of all, I will change the units from millimeter to inch, and I will load the image, uh, sorry, the finite element uh, Mish that I already created. So here in Mish, I will load this one and it will take some time until it's loaded. So please be patient with me. There we go. So this is the finite element mesh. Now, what I need to do is to create a zone and the, the zone that I will create it actually, it's the, the region of interest that I want to um, check the trains and displacements in. So I will define this zone. Notice that I will make the zone a little bit more than the line, the end line that I want to watch. So I will take this zone and click on add. It become red. Then you need to validate it and it will become green as you can see the program was divided these rectangular uh, uh, elements into triangle elements as you can see here okay so now we are done with this step and we need to go to the third step which is pre-calibration in pre-calibration here coming the rule for the pre-calibration points. So let's know what are the pre-calibration points. Pre-calibration points, let's go here first. So it's type of matching between the mesh that you have and the pictures that you were taken. 
Now, you are telling actually the computer where are these points here on this uh, image where they are located on the mesh. So the computer will know the exact location of each element. So this is why we need to do the pre-calibration. Now, uh, when we before we start the, the test itself, we defined some points, which are circled by red here. These points were defined, and what we are we have the coordinates of each point of these points, and we need to add them here. We need to define them here. So in order to uh, define these pre-calibration points, we will start by select. And as you can see here, it's very dark. I can see uh, in a very nice way, in a clear way, what is going on in this picture. So actually what I did, we created something we called pre-calibration points, that the datum pictures, sorry. We created datum pictures, which are, this is the picture number zero, uh, and all what we did, we manipulated the, the lighting so we can see what's going on inside. So uh, the program can give me that uh, feature. I can upload datum image from a camera. So I will go to reload. And um, I will go to datum pictures. I need to change this to TIF. This is the extension of the files that I have uploaded and open it. And the, the data picture was uploaded. Then I will do the same thing for cam number two and upload this picture. There we go. Okay. So now I will define the pre-calibration pictures. I will go to select and choose. This was my first one point. Actually, I'm zooming using the scroll of the mask of the mouse. And if you want to move the picture, you click on the, uh, the wheel of the mouse and you can move it. So that was point number two. I need to be as accurate as I can. This is point number three, four, five, six. And this is number seven. These points, all these points, the coordinates of these points in a three dimension were taken before the test started, assuming that this is our origin point. Okay. Now I need to put these points here. So I will start with point number one. You have to go with the same sequence. So this is point number one. And I need to do some modification here. So y is minus 2.5 and z is 0.25, yeah, 20.25 inch. That was point number one. Then this is point number two here. This is point number three. As you can see, the green point here refers to this point here as well. And if I go to choose number four, five, six, and this is number seven. So I'm done with the mesh and first camera pictures. And I need to repeat the same thing for camera number two. Now, instead of repeating uh, all the points, the pre-calibration points on the mesh, there's a feature to copy them. So I just say I will copy 3D point, points from cam number one and copy them and they were copied. All what I need to do is to define the points on the picture for camera number two. So this is point number one. This is point number two. This is a three, four, five, six, and this is number seven. Okay. Now, as I define these points, I need to hit this button 
run and the mesh will be here as you can see the dots are inside the squares which means that they were defined pretty, pretty accurate the mesh shape there is no deformation in it it's located where we want it for both cameras so we are in a good condition now you can see that the minimum number of speckles inside each element is three so we have more than three for each element as you can see here so we are in a good way okay now as we done with this we need to go to calibration and here uh, I will choose very small convergence criteria. So we have to define three numbers here. The first number is the number of iteration number max. For me, I think um, 50, let's take 100 instead of 50. That will be better. Uh, regularization length, yeah, there's a recommendation to use the regularization length as minimum as the, um, the width of the element or, the, of, or uh, element size. So here my element size is one inch. <coughs> and we need to define the convergence criteria. Usually I'm going with very high convergence criteria like one multiplied by 10 to the power minus five. But here, since we are talking about, um, uh, this is for illustration purposes. Uh, so I will not go with that high convergence criteria because this will be like a time dependent factor. And in order not to take a lot of your time, I will go with a convergence course convergence criteria like 0 0.001 inch. And I will run the program here. As I, you can see here, the iterations are going to 100. Then the algorithm was converged within like 14 trial, which is, I think it's good. Okay, it's gave out the residuals here. It's about 6% and it's only 14 iterations. So I think we are in good condition here. And we can see that on cam one and two. Okay, now we need to go to the displacement. This is the step that the displacement fields will be calculated. So we need to repeat what we did in calibration step. We will go with 100 iterations in max. This is the maximum number of iterations for each picture. Uh, we define the regularization length as one inch and the convergence criteria as point of one. So we will go with that and run the program. As you can see here, for each image, the number of iterations are doing the program that are going through to uh, get converged and it's converged very fast because we we used like a coarse convergence criteria. We reach image number 20. Here, what you are seeing in the window is the displacement in X direction. In, this, in addition to that, you can go, for example, for residuals and see how it's going. Here you see, there's a crack going on here. Okay, so I need to go through the output, to show you something here. So as you can see, if you go up, for example, for picture image number 24, after one iteration, it was converged, the algorithm was converged. And it's, it's almost the same thing for image number 26, it took three iterations and so on and all the for all the pictures the algorithm has converged which means that we get accurate results based on the convergence criteria that we 
already defined and the regularization length and the maximum number of iterations. But I noticed that one of the pictures, the number of iterations was not enough. So for example, let's take this, uh, this image number 38. You can see that the increase of element, uh, the, sorry, the increment is 0 0.016 and it's going up, then it's going down and going down, 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 down until it reached 0 0.0011. And that was the maximum number of iterations, but it didn't, uh, the, the uh, algorithm was not conversed. Why? Because we need higher number of iterations to reach that. So this is for, for element number 38, but I think it didn't repeat until we reached the last two pictures it's converged for all the pictures here, except number 54. And it didn't convert. And number 55, it didn't convert because these pictures were taken after failure. So, so that's make sense here. Uh, in order to solve the problem, I will increase the number of iteration max to 250 and rerun the program again. And we notice here from the green uh, uh, text that these pictures were uh, the algorithm for these images were conversed. Um, let's see the others, number 12. Remember, number 38 was a problem. The algorithm didn't convert that, that uh, image. Here the crack was up here. This is number 36, 37, and 38. Let's see if it will convert within 250 iteration. Maybe it's before. See, it's 111 and it's conversed. Okay. Okay, 54. This is before the last picture. And this is the last picture. And then the algorithm was converged for the last one. Okay. So what are um, the information that we get from this analysis. Let's go one by one. So this is the displacement in X direction. And you can see here, if you go back to image number zero, and so here, um, the maximum the displacement in X direction, this is X direction, it's range from minus one to the power 10 minus three to 6.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4, which is very small amount. This is around zero. Then it's started to increase, like as we applied the load. Until we reach the failure point. So this is the displacement in X direction. We can get also the displacement in Y direction. And notice how this is the load is applied here. This is the support. So you can see that here in this region, this is the higher displacement in Y direction, which makes sense. We have the displacement in Z direction and we have, before going to this, uh, normal displacement, it is the displacement in Z direction as well. The magnitude, it's like the resultant for that. And the residuals, this is the residuals from the uh, digital image correlation equation. And uh, here, the program is using this residual to allocate where the program felt to calculate 
to, to get to get converged for so for these elements you have um, what we call it the higher residual and the higher residual will be used to locate a crack inside our uh, spaceman here uh, this this spaceman this beam is made of concrete so here is the crack number one this is the extension of the crack and here is another crack here we have three cracks okay also we can find the strain in x direction and you can see the location of crack very clear here you can also add the principal strain and you can show the strain orientation. So since this is the strain in X direction, and this is work for X direction only. So since this is the strain in X direction, you can see all the strain direction is in X direction. But if we activated principal strains, you can see the change in the direction uh, of the uh, principal strains for each element here. And it's changed from one picture to another. You can remove the rigid body diagram, uh, rigid body movement, sorry. Uh, and this is removed by um, uh, make it, taking the average of the displacement in, in, y, in y direction. So this is one of the definitions that you can have here. You can see that effect here in y, for example. See how these numbers will change when you activate remove the rigid body. Or you add it. And we have strains in Y. Strain 2, 2 means the strain in Y. And we can show as well the strain, the shear strain, or strain 1, one 2. And you can see the location of the crack here, as you can see. So if we go back, for example, you can see in at image number 21, it's very difficult to see like major change in strain uh, in shear strain. But when you go more you can see here that location of the string so we can extract all this information i will show you how to do that and we have also the post processing tab it's activated now the post processing tab showing us there's the beam it's showing us uh, some results so what we can do actually we can put sensors whenever we want here inside the region of interest and we can so we can draw some charts so for example if i would like to draw the displacement in y direction all what i need is to create a sensor here in sensor list i will create a sensor i will call the sensor under load bottom and i can define the type of the sensor it could be displacement or it could be strain, force, virtual extensometer, in displacement and strain. So I will choose displacement and hit OK. And here, as you move the cursor, you can see that the coordinates change. So I will choose this one. I already have a strain, a, a, an LVDT, LVDT uh, a strain, uh, sorry, LVDT gauge there. So I will compare the results between the two. And I can go after that. If I want to uh, show the, the chart, I need to create a plot. I will call it displacement. And here in the plot details, the x axis will be time and the y axis will be displacement in y direction. And here, you can see as we the time increases, the change in the displacement is going down until we reach these two points before failure, and these are the points after failure. So the point just before failure, it was like 0.363, and the result that I uh, already recorded from my LVDT, it was about 0.37. So it's very close, and it's pretty accurate here. Um, so here you can see, this is the first type of uh, sensors that you can add. Um, the other type of sensors that you can add, it's a train, uh, strain sensor. So I will create a strain sensor 
I will call it number one, for example. And you can put it wherever you want. So for example, if I would like to measure the strain here at this point, I will click and you can see this white area is the area that the strain will be calculated in. So what we need to define here is the, are, are the following information. So I need to define the name of the uh, strain gauge. I need to define the orientation. So here uh, it's the alpha, the orientation angle is zero, means that it will be in X direction. So if I want to measure the strain in Y direction, for example, I will say this is 90 and you can see how it's also rotated or maybe for, you can add it as 45 degrees, whatever you want. So you can measure the strain in different angles. I will choose here zero. Then you need to define the size of the element. And here I will take the size of the element equals to the size of the element that I already, already defined, which is one inch by one inch. So here, as you can see, okay. So this element will be shared between one, two, three, four, five, six, um, eight, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six elements. And it will take the average of the strain in X direction for all these elements. That's why I try to, to make it like as small as I can. And if I would like to draw the strain, what I will do actually, I will create another plot. I will call it strain. And here for the strain, I will keep the axis is time x axis is time and uh, x in y uh, direction i will take the uh, not the displacement not this one i will take this one and it will take the strain in one one direction so we can see that we started with strain very small amounts and it then it's going to increase a little bit by a little bit then we have jumped between this point and this point which means that was a huge amount of strain in x direction was here also, you can draw the strain in y direction and the strain, the shear strain as well. Okay. Now, what else that we can do? I can change the view, the display, what is displayed here from displacement in x direction, for example. I will choose the strain in one one direction in x direction or i can choose strain in two two or maybe strain one two or you can choose the residual for example and here you can define um, some sensors on both sides of the uh, of that crack so let's see the shear strain okay now so this is the area of the high strain i will avoid it and to try to take to put some displacement sensors i will create displacement sensors i will call the first one i will call it right which is will be on the right of the um of the crack so maybe i will put it here and i will create another displacement uh, um, sensor i will call it left and i will put it on the left side the same distance almost here almost the same distance from the high strain area and then if i will go in which plot i need to check displacement because these are displacements I will uncheck this one and I will check the displacement in X direction for the right one and for the left one to compare between them. So as you can see here, they were pretty matching in displacements until you reached this point, which is image number 29. And then in picture number 30, you have separation, which means that the distance in x direction uh, enlarged here, which means that the crack at this height from the beam 
was reached its value, it was cracked means at picture number 30. Okay. And then the difference between them increases, which makes sense. So the crack is opening while you are increasing the load. Okay. Or you can create a displacement virtual extensometer and we will call it ext1 this will measure the difference between two sensors so i will use the right and left so it will show me the difference between these two sensors i will say okay and also on the displacement plot i will uh, deactivate this and I will take extensometer number one so you can see that it was pretty close to zero until it reached 29 and then you have jump which means that you have a crack appeared here so these are the types of ten sensors that we can add here we can do the same thing for the strain gauge we can do extensometer for by putting two strain gates on two sides of the uh, of the element of the uh, crack or Let's see how it's work. Okay, so I will create a uh, um, left citrine that will be a strain gauge. Say okay, and I will put it maybe here, and it will be one, one. Okay then I need to create right citrine and it's a citrine gauge and that will be somewhere maybe here okay so it will be one one okay and if I go to citrine plot I can draw the um, the train in x direction not this one actually not this one so i can draw the strain in x direction for the left and for the right sensor and here you can see the separation between two of them also let's see the right strain in the shear strain here and the shear strain here okay also we can create extensometer a virtual extensometer in citrine and we'll call it ext citrine okay and we will choose okay so here we have to choose either right or left as well. And this is the difference between them. Okay. Now I will do something here. Actually, I will add, I will create a sensor. I will call it pre left. And this will be somewhere, it's a displacement, and it will be somewhere here. Okay, I need to create pre left. Okay, and it will be somewhere here. So I will choose another uh, point. What I am doing here actually, I'm trying to measure to measure the displacement at this node, which is before the crack, and this is another and compare it with this, this the displacement in this node, which is also on the left on the crack. Uh, theoretically, since you don't have any crack between them, the displacement in x or y or z direction should be very pretty matching here. And you should have difference between what you have here. So let's see. 
um, if I go to draw uh, in, uh, okay, I don't need this one. I need the displacement and I will activate this one, deactivate it. And let's see what you have. So I will take the point on the right and I want to see the displacement in X direction. I will go to the point on the left to see the displacement in X direction as well. And this is the separation that we talked about. And also I will activate this point, the pre-left, uh, to see the uh, displacement in X direction. So it's pretty matching with what we have for the left point. That means this is a good uh, measurement to know that there is no this difference in displacements here, which means there is no crack between them. But you have a crack between these points, these two points, this point and this point. OK, now let's see what type of uh, data that we can extract from here. So if I go back to calibration points, calibration tab, I can export the measured shape export. So here, let's define another uh, folder. Let's call it data. Let's do it number four. Okay. And here, I will define inside it another folder. We call um, it was the name of it. The measured shape export and I need to give it a name I will give it the name of test save and if you go here this is the data and measure shape export and we have three folders the first one is test zero here it show me the internal node number for all nodes that you have. Forget about the original node number. This is a sequence given by the computer. And this is the position of each node in X direction, in Y direction, Z direction. And you have UX, UY, and UZ. And you can see UX and UY is zero for all nodes. So these are the coordination, the coordinates that you get for picture number zero, which is uh, the picture which was before the load. And here we have some distortion in data in Z direction, which you don't need to take in consideration. Okay, I don't say anything. Now, for the test connectivity, this Excel sheet will give me the definition for each element, which is a triangle element, and which nodes are connected for these elements. So for element number zero, it is connecting nodes number zero, one, and two. And let's go here to the software. So if we assume, and we will see, if this is uh, um, element number zero, it should be either this one or this one maybe. So for example, this will be node number zero, this num or node number one, and this node number two, or whatever the sequence that they have. So it defined the relationship between each element and the nodes. And if you go to the third Excel sheet, which is the test residuals, this will give me the residuals for uh, picture number zero. Now, by comparing this sheet, which defines for each element which nodes are located, are connected to this, uh, to the to that element, and the location of each node, you can define each element, the location of each element. Okay. So that the first set of data that we can extract. What else? Now, if I go to the displacement and go also to export, displacement export, and I will create a new folder here, call it displacement export. 
I will call test as well. Save. And here you can see different types of data sets were extracted. Each one, each set of these data will start from number one and it uh, ends at number 55. So this is uh, the set of data for each image where you taken when uh, the load was added. So what type of sets that I have here? I have, this is the first set. Call it number one. The second set is the connectivity, which was defined before. I'm trying to separate these sets to show you what, what the meaning of each set of data. This is the principal strains and the orientation of that strain. And this is for residuals. And then you have the strains. So let's see for the first uh, uh, set of data what it contains. So remember, this is number one means this is image number one. It has the internal node number. It has the position of each node. And here you have the displacement field. So you have the displacement in X direction, in Y direction, in Z direction, and the normal, which is the same as UZ, which is the normal on the plane that we were measuring. Okay, you can see that UX is negative, which means it's, um, if you can go to the coordinate system that we have, it means that it was moving in this direction, to the left, not to the right. Okay, and here UI, it's positive, which means it's going up. And if it is negative, which means it's going down. Okay, so let's go to and see, like, for example, picture number 40 or image number 40, you can see that using most of them, they are a negative value, which means that the displacement was majorly going down. It was going in this direction, which makes sense as well. So in the first set of data, you have the displacement uh, field. The connectivity will show you again, the relationship between each uh, element and the, the nodes which are connected to that element. And for a principal strain, I will go for this one, for example, this image number 35, it will give me majorly for each element. Remember that from finite element, we know since you have a, a triangular element, which means that you have a constant citrine element, which means that the citrine on this element is the same wherever you are going. Okay, so it will give you the maximum citrine, the maximum uh, uh, strain, and the minimum citrine, and it will show you uh, the, uh, the x's for each one of them. So this is the orientation. And for residuals, it will, it will give you the residual for each element. So for, sorry, for each node. Oh yeah, for each element. So for each element that you have, oh, I was right. For each element that you have, you have the, me, the mean of the residual at that element. Okay, at each loading stage. 
and the last set of data, it will give you the strain for each element here, not node because this is a constant strain element, as we said. So you have the strain in X direction, in Y direction, and the shear in one, two direction or X, Y direction. Here you can see that other values of strains are equal to zero. It's, it's not measured by this uh, program. So now you have the displacement, you have a field, you have the strain field for each loading stage. Also you have, you know, the connectivity and you have the principal strain and you have the residuals. What else that you can get? Actually, you can get this, for example. If you would like to draw the change in displacement in X direction or make it as a video, for example, what you can do is, well, let's go, maybe not for this, let's see the residual, something more interesting. Uh, you can extract it, you can export all the images for all pictures, which is related to residual by either, if you, let's just start by one by one, one by one. So if you would like to extract the current 3D window export, this one, that will give you the picture So that will give you the residuals picture at loading stage number 32 or image number 32. If you are interested in this picture only, this is what you get. There is the image that you are looking for. Or if you would like to, to extract all the pictures for all the images that you have, you can go to file export and then batch export. Define the name for that of the batch that you're exporting. So let's say this is the residual. Okay, and this is the location. We need to define the location. I will put it in the data. I will. Okay, let's put it here. And it will start export all the figures from number zero to 55. See? Okay, now we are done. So if we go to picture by picture, you can see the development in the residuals as you are increasing the load. See, so you have the crack now until you reach failure. Okay. Also, if you go to post processing, you can extract this chart by going to file, export, chart export, and you can put it here, for example. So here's the chart that you exported, or you can export as well the sensor export, which means that will give you all the information of the sensors that you have. I will give it an in test as well, save it. And if I go here to the sensor, you can see that it defines the sensors that you have. It's CSV file, so I need to go to data and text the column. Find that it's separated by semicolon and finish it. And here, you have the strain in 1, 1, 2, 2, and 1, 2 for each increase. This is for test sensor number 1, which is the train. And you will get, uh, let's don't save anything. Okay, and you have the same information for the exterior number 1, uh, EXTS for each sensor that we have. Now let's take another sensor which is related to displacement, for example, also at the CSV file. And let's go to data, text to columns, 
let's create that semicolon next finish and it will give you for each time which means for each picture it will give you the displacement in x y and z direction for that sensor so i think that's all what i can tell you about uh, related to this uh, software i know that um, this video is a uh, pretty long but i think that was necessary to explain all what i know about it um, i hope that uh, i didn't waste your time and see you in the next video thank you